All right, so I'm Madrona Murphy. I'm the botanist for Quiot and uh, a self-identified fruit nerd, particularly apples. Um, but because this is about fruitful futures, I'm going to try and take you on a slightly broader tour of some of the fruit heritage of the islands and talk about the future of, of the heritage fruit trees, the heritage varieties, and some of the uh, creative ways that people are both making use of them and sharing their harvests with each other. So I'll try and give you a little tour of all of that and then hopefully be able to answer some questions even though I can't be there in person. So this is a little roadmap to my talk. I'm gonna take you through why there are so many old trees here in the islands, um, what kinds of fruit are on those trees. Because a lot of the um, visits to orchards I do are focused on trying to figure out what varieties of apples people have, I'm gonna also take you through a quick look at how you look at an apple when trying to identify a mystery variety. Um, and hopefully also give you a sense of some of the pitfalls in trying to identify those varieties and why it's not always so simple. Um, sometimes though, you don't care what kind of fruit you have, you wanna know how to use it. So we're gonna talk about that as well. Um, and then because this isn't just about the fruit, it's also about the trees that, that are bearing the fruit and their history. We're gonna talk some about how you take care of old trees, what you can do with old trees. And then looking to the future, talking about ways that you can share your harvest and ways that people are sharing their harvests. And then a little brief excursion on why it's so exciting to live in an area where apples and pears and plums and cherries and maybe some quinces have been freely sowing their seeds for more than a hundred years. So why are there so many trees here? Um, this is a map of Friday Harbor with all those little dots being um, orchards mapped in in the T-sheets. These are the uh, topographic maps from the um, 1880s and 1890s. So this is a very old map of Friday Harbor showing you that it was extensively planted in fruit trees. Um, but why are there so many old trees here? Well, it's a very good climate uh, for fruit trees. These are native apples growing on Lopez and we have the right conditions for apples to thrive even without a great deal of attention. Um, native Malus fusca, the Pacific crab apple, grows throughout the islands, enjoys this kind of soggy winter that uh, it looks like we might be anticipating here. And even in the case of Malus fusca, even does pretty well um, with some salty, salty soil and salt spray. So we have excellent conditions for fruit trees with a relatively dry summer that allows for good ripening, sometimes a dry spring that allows for very nice pollination, but also a, a nice damp winter um, that allows the soak up moisture and continue throughout those dry seasons. So we have very good conditions, but it's a little more complicated than that. Um, people also found fruit growing to be a very, at least initially a very promising um, business. So this is actually the area on Orcas that's now Camp Orkaila with some of the Seattle Fruit Company's uh, orchards in the 1930s. These are from aerial photos taken, I think by the Canadian military that were digitized by the county and are available on the county's website. So you can see extensive orchards planted at that time. So um, people were planting initially um, prunes and then apples and pears, um, cherries as well and also some of the, the row crops and exporting them all over the place, both by ship and by rail. And this is at a time when Eastern Washington didn't have the kind of irrigation it does now that allowed them to start producing, um, competitively producing fruit. So the islands were kind of the fruit basket of the region. Um, but this is, this is from Boyd's research. You can see that we used to have a lot more fruit trees than we have now. So why are there so many old trees? The answer is because there used to be a whole lot more. Um, people planted amazing amounts of orchards. They're, people are still planting orchards, but the remnant orchards in the islands actually are a very small portion of the fruit trees that were initially planted here, um, particularly around 1910, 1890 to 1910. So there are all these remnant orchards that have survived because apples and pears and 
cherries and, and quince and plums do really well here. Um, but what kinds of fruit are they still producing? So here's, here's a little bit of a tour. Um, and this is gonna feature a lot of the watercolors from the USDA Pomological Watercolor Collection, which is a free resource online. These are amazing watercolors that are detailed drawings of fruit, detailed paintings of fruit um, that were collected, I'm not sure the whole scale of the time, but it's a neat resource to check out. I encourage people to uh, take a look. It's both art, but also a wonderful resource in getting a sense of the diversity of fruit grown um, throughout the United States, but including here in the islands. There are, there are actually watercolors of fruit um, collected in the islands in that collection. So I'm going to start with apples, which are the most diverse fruit in those old orchards in the islands. Um, and this is probably the most abundant or most common of those apples. And one of my favorites for sure, which is King, um, more properly known as King of Tompkins County. Uh, it's from New Jersey. And in the islands, it's been grown here. I just realized I can't see my own date on there because of the way I've got my screen set up. I, I think that says 1889. It might say 1892. It's a triploid apple, which means that it has an extra set of chromosomes. Um, a lot of very popular large varieties are like that. But it also means that it doesn't produce viable pollen. So if you have an old orchard with a king, you're going to want to make sure that you have at least two other varieties of apple that bloom at the same time. Uh, kings are a good fresh eating apple, but they're also a pretty multi purpose apple. They make excellent fresh cider, um, they bake well, and they keep pretty well, although they get greasy. If you want to identify a king, what you're looking for is a large apple with beautiful stripes. Typically in the islands, they're oblong, although kings also come in round. They have a big wide open central star on the core there, and they have almost a, a, a wine-like grapey fruit flavor, uh, very distinctive flavor, slightly yellow flesh. So kings are definitely one of the most common uh, heritage fruit varieties uh, in, in the islands in old orchards. The trees are also extremely robust. Uh, sometimes you get the sense you're looking at a king apple tree just from the stature of the tree itself. Another very important variety here in the islands are Rhode Island greenings. Um, <laughs> the name in this case is correct. They do come from Rhode Island, although the green is kind of a, a funny name. They're greenings because that's, they're a green cooking apple, but they were also discovered by a Mr. Green. So they're sort of doubly green. Um, they're also a triploid, although not as large as the kings. And Despite being a superlative cooking apple, they're also relatively multi-use. They make a beautiful cider. They oxidize very early, and so it's a kind of a dark cider. And they make, in my opinion, the best apple butter on earth. But they're sweet enough to eat fresh as well. So they're recognizable by being kind of a, a clear, pure green with uh, distinct white dots on them, distinct lenticles, and, with, and they never have any stripes. They, can vary a bit in shape and size, and they tend to be a little ribbed, a little bit lumpy, but they never have any stripes. They'll often have kind of a, a blush on the cheek that faces the sun, but no stripes. Gravensteins are a group of apples um, rather than a single variety, and they're our early, one of our most abundant early apples, and have been produced in the islands for quite some time, including a, a very fun discovery that um, I find out about because Boyd sent me some newspaper clippings when we were working together on researching the history of, of fruit varieties and fruit growing here in the islands, which is an, a red Gravenstein variety that was found in, in Olga in 1905 and widely marketed. Um, and this painting here is actually that red Gravenstein from Olga, um, which was exciting to discover in the Pomological Watercolor Collection. So, Gravensteins are also triploid. So imagine here, if you have an orchard with just kings, greenings, and gravensteins, you won't get any fruit because none of them produce viable pollen. But it's an early apple with a high acid and high sugar content. So it makes it very good for um, fresh eating. They have a delicious flavor, even if they are somewhat delicate in texture, but also um, very versatile. The juice is very good for fresh cider, but can also be 
fermented, they can be baked very nicely. Um, so a very, a very wonderful apple, but one that I think sometimes is consumed a little overripe and not necessarily appreciated as much as it should be. So large, lumpy apple, um, very early, distinctive sweet tart flavor. That's your Gravenstein. 20 ounce Pippins. Here I'm gonna introduce a, a apple that actually if you planted it in that orchard with your Kings, your, your uh, Rhode Island Greenings and your Gravensteins, you would get fruit, which is the 20 ounce Pippin, which is not triploid. It produces viable pollen. It's a large apple, sometimes mistaken for King, but it's rounder. And uh, the picture here with it cut shows you one of the easy ways to tell it apart if you're not tasting it, which is that it has a very interesting blunt shaped star in, in the middle. So the core has an interesting shape. Um, it's a large striped apple with a, a distinctive sweet tart flavor that's different than the uh, Gravenstein. So a little hard to describe, maybe a little, um, I don't know, sprightlier. You'll have to you'll have to taste them. They're wonderful apples, uh, but they're not keepers. So in this case, people were growing them for fresh use or for cooking, and they make a nice applesauce. They break down, um, and they act as a, a wonderful pollinizer for the other apples in your orchard. So twenty ounce pippins are pretty common in the islands uh, in old orchards, typically interplanted with things like Gravensteins and Kings, um, both because of the good harvest, but also to make sure that there's sufficient pollen to get fruit off the rest of them. Um, blue pearmain is probably the prettiest apple I have ever seen. It's definitely the prettiest apple I've ever grown. This is a variety that is not as common in old orchards in the islands, but was highly recommended um, at a time when people were establishing commercial orchards. It's a late variety. The blue in this case refers to the, the bloom on it that makes what is otherwise a dark red apple look almost purple. Um, it's a good keeper. It doesn't shrivel in storage. And it has a flavor that I would say is similar to a king with a slightly uh, different texture. It's not as juicy as the king, a little bit meatier. Um, beautiful apple, one that I think should be more commonly grown and definitely does well in the islands. There's an old blue pearmain near the roadside on Lopez that's got to be at least 120 years old and is still producing. The russets are apples that I think are, are definitely underappreciated these days because uh, sometimes people don't realize that the coloring is intentional. This isn't any kind of defect on these apples. They have a rough coat and it's associated with um, a distinctive flavor, they, a distinctive flavor and texture. Russets are very nutty. They're sweet and tart and nutty and a relatively dry texture. Um, so I, I would say they're best sliced and make an excellent dessert sliced with cheese, but they're not perhaps the kind of apple you just bite into. And we have Roxbury russets, uh, English russets, golden russets, brown russets, and some mystery russets that have all been planted in the islands. This is Roxbury russet, which is the oldest American apple variety. Um, and has been grown in the island since 1889 because since of the oldest orchards on Lopez and the Lopez was mapped on those tea sheets in 1889. Um, it makes a lovely cider. All the russets, they don't produce a lot of juice, but that juice is kind of clear golden. And because of the high sugar and high acid, it's very flavorful, fresh, but also can be fermented. Uh, Roxbury russets keep well. Historical outlook, so you can see the returns given over the history of is counts, even though it had to change in a different. Oh. So this russet is one that's found on, on Lopez and which is known as brown russet, but um, we're not quite sure if that's because of the color or because of the orchard uh, that it was found in. There's an orchard on Lopez planted by the Browns uh, prior to 1889, and this apple is found there. It's later, longer, larger uh, than than Roxbury russet and has slightly different, you know, it's not quite the same apple, very similar taste, and it produces a beautiful golden cider. So the, um, even though Roxbury and brown russet are very similar, uh, it, they seem to have been enough that people planted them within the, sometimes even within the same orchards. Uh, this 
at this point seems to be a variety that's unique to the islands, which is kind of exciting, a heritage variety that, that I don't know of being anywhere else. Um, I, I keep looking to see if someone else has reported a, a similar variety, but for now, this variety was abundantly planted on Lopez and I haven't seen it on the other islands yet. So if you have a, a late long russet with an open calyx, the calyx and see if it's the same russet that we're seeing here on Lopez. So wonderful local uh, late ripening russet that seems to be very well adapted to our conditions. Um, yellow bellflower is another unique apple that's probably under, um, not well known and, and somewhat underappreciated, but has been grown here in the islands all along. Um, it's distinctly long conical sometimes. So that's to say that it's shaped kind of like a, a salal blossom, which is where the bellflower comes from. So long with a narrow bottom, um, very, very high sugar content in bellflowers sometimes. The, the shape varies, but the flavor doesn't. So they taste, to me, they taste like a, um, a gravenstein, but ripen much later and keep much better. Um, this apple is relatively easy to identify by its flavor and the fact that it has a very um, kind of an open core. Apparently, sometimes when they're ripe, the seeds will rattle in them. So even though the shape varies quite a bit, late ripening, um, very intense flavor, and this, this broad, wide open core. And one thing that you can sort of see in the picture that I've got up here is it also has a very long tube at the bottom there where the, um, that's where the flower used to be. And so the core is actually very high in that apple, which is unusual. So it helps in identifying it. Wagoner is another apple that was planted. And I don't know that people know much about this apple anymore. It's a keep, good keeping dessert apple with an odd shape and that tends to get better in storage. Lopsided kind of apple, mostly, mostly green with red blush and one that is considered better later than fresh off the tree. And that's probably one of the reasons it's not as popular now is people expect their apples to be ready and delicious as soon as you pick them. People have probably encountered Wolf River sometimes. They're a very impressive apple. You kind of want to hold them in two hands because they're that large. Um, they have been planted in the islands all along as well and are easy to identify by their, their huge size. They're the biggest red apple we have. Uh, unfortunately, even though they're, they're this beautiful, juicy looking apple, they're really a cooking apple um, and not that much appreciated fresh. So um, on the other hand, you wouldn't need very many Wolf Rivers to make a pie. They're, they're certainly quite productive apples. They also dry well. So if you, if you have a Wolf River, you might find that you can, that it's a good keeping apple by drying rather than, than wrapping up a newspaper and storing that way. Winter banana is another keeper. I feel like I've got apples forever here. I, I promise there are other fruit. Uh, winter banana is very easy to identify because it's just yellow and pink. Most of our apples have stripes or speckles or russet and winter banana has nothing but, but the yellow and the pink, maybe a tiny bit of russet around the top. And it's, it's called banana, not because of its flavor, but because it very often has kind of a, a seam down the side that makes it look like you could peel it like a banana. And they're, they're late ripening and long keeping, very nice, fragrant, fruity apple. Um, and while they, they, are, they sound sort of like a modern variety, it's, it's actually quite an old variety. Um, and un, unlike most of the apples that I've introduced to you that are found in our old orchards, it's from Indiana. So it's not a New England apple. Um, uh, one unique thing about winter banana is that it's graft compatible with pears. So you can actually, most of the time, you can only graft an apple onto an apple and a pear onto a pear, but a winter banana will graft onto pear or um, you, could, you could graft pear onto it and it can thus, it can be used an interstem to put a pear onto an apple tree. It's, it's an odd thing and I'm not sure why that works, but it's, it's a neat trick that this particular variety is capable of. So Ben Davis is the last apple I'm gonna introduce you to. I don't wanna give you the impression that these are the only heritage varieties planted in the islands though. Um, these are just some of the ones that I know are still in orchards um, and that you might encounter. 
but there is a, quite a few other varieties that have already been identified in old orchards. So um, if, if you, the variety you have in your old orchard isn't here, um, we might still know what it is. Ben Davis is a, a long keeper. It seems like in the islands here, it's really something you wanna put in storage and eat when all the rest of your apples have, have shriveled and, and gone mushy. That fresh, it's not gonna taste as good as it will um, months later, not just because it's the only apple that's still firm, but because it will actually improve in storage. Um, this apple, there's a historic tree of uh, Ben Davis um, out at uh, English camp, a British camp in the Sandwith Orchard. So this one's been planted out here for quite some time. Seems to be incredibly productive in the islands. The way to identify Ben Davis, it's one of the parents of Cortland. And like Cortland, it has a very small um, central star. So that's kind of the core in the middle. You can see both in the watercolor and in the, um, the photo here that it's a relatively large apple, but the, the seeds are in a very small area and that's pretty unique. So that definitely helps in identifying Ben Davis. But people didn't just plant apples here. Um, you probably have encountered pears and Anjou was, was one of the varieties of pears relatively extensively planted. Um, it's got a smooth texture and it's, it's a late keeper has relatively few grit cells. So in terms of texture, it's smoother uh, once it's ripe. I think Anjou is also interesting in being one of the few pears that tastes pretty okay, even when it's not ripe, uh, which is not true of most of the pears that are planted here. Clap's favorite is another pear variety that was planted here in the island. Now, I'm not sure if I've encountered this in orchards. I'm still learning my pears and so, um, I'll give you a picture here of what it looked like when it was painted, um, but in terms of how extensively it's still grown in the island, um, I'd have to hear from folks who have pears and see if we can sort that out. It's a good fresh eating pear and relatively early, so it harvests, it's harvested in late August. Shaped like a Bartlett, but with a redder cheek. Bartlett's were the most extensively planted pears in the islands, um, both for fresh eating and for, for drying and they're still harvested and used in, in preserves and for drying. They're pear-shaped, they've got more grit cells than the Anjou, so you'll, you'll encounter that texture. They are your classic pear flavor, they're the Williams pear, which is also used in making um, pear brandy. So a very, very distinguished pear uh, and quite delicious and still growing throughout the islands in old, old orchards that have pear trees. Pear trees are a little harder to maintain sometimes than the old apples because if left alone, they just grow upward um, and it can be difficult to harvest the pears uh, in an old, in a heritage orchard. A couple other varieties that should be found in, in old orchards here, um, both very, very lovely um, and I don't know what they taste like because I haven't definitively found any, but just to give you a small sense of the diversity of pears, that were planted in the islands and at least some of them still persist here. Pears can continue producing for up to 400 years. So I expect that all, there are some examples of almost all of the pears that were originally planted in the island. But it's not just pears, um, plums as well. If particularly green gauges, uh, there are three different varieties of, of plums that are, that are now are just thought of as green gauges. All the green gauges descend from Persian plums, um, which were more commonly harvested unripe um, and eaten, either eaten with salt or made into preserves. One of the things that's kind of neat about the plums is that they'll spread by root. And so you can find old orchards that may have had maybe a dozen plums in them that now have hundreds and they're still producing fruit. And I've seen this with the green gauges for sure. Green gauges are dense, they're sweet, and they're quite high in pectin, but they're not a drying plum. So they make excellent preserves and they're quite good eaten fresh, but unlike the prunes, they were not being harvested in order to dry and ship. Prunes, we have at least um, three varieties, wait, that's four varieties of, of prunes grown here in the islands. Uh, Italian prune being the most sort of, which has the most name recognition. 
but then there's also the French or Petit Prune, uh, German Prune, Golden Prune. Most prunes are freestone, they're sweet, they dry well, they have very dense flesh. Um, there was a whole prune craze on Orcas when folks who had orchards thought they would make their, their millions by growing and drying and shipping prunes. And so you will find prune trees in many, many, many of the old orchards in the islands. Um, and we're, we're blessed that there's such diversity of prunes as well. So beautiful, wonderful, underappreciated plums, in my opinion, because of their, they're so often encountered only as a dried product and fresh prune, prunes are wonderful. They bake beautifully in pies. They make incredible preserves. Um, and yes, they're just wonderful, fresh out of hand. So certainly we are, it's one of the wonderful fruitful legacies of the islands is how much, how many prune trees were planted throughout and how many of those still survive. And then the silver prune, which is actually a, a golden plum, Coe's golden drop. There are some egg plums that were planted here as well that are also yellow, but they're not quite as meaty. They wouldn't dry as well. And Hungarian prune, which, or Hungarian plum, which looks a bit like a prune, also known as pond seedling, um, and I think is mostly used as a fresh eating plum. And these, uh, unlike the pears where I'm still trying to sort out which are still here, all of these um, plums are still present in old island orchards. But that's really just scratching the surface. We have a huge diversity of fruits growing here that were planted here and that continue to grow here in the islands. Um, crab apples, huge diversity of apples, plums, including plums that have gone feral. And so there's sort of seedling plums all over the place. Um, some incredible pears. Um, the, one of the pictures in here that's got small crab apples in it is actually a hybrid between the native crab apple and uh, domestic apples. And so new diversity is being generated all the time. So what kind of, of fruit do the island's orchards produce? They produce a lot, a huge diversity of apples, pears, plums, and, and occasionally cherries and quince as well. Okay, <laughs> if I haven't lost you there yet, I'm gonna give you a quick overview on how you look at apples um, so that I can give you some tools in sorting out the varieties that you have. Apples start by looking at the size. Um, and when we talk about size in apples, we're really starting with the, the kind of apples that you'd find in the store today are technically large apples. So that's large. Something like the King's is very large. Um, and a medium apple these days probably wouldn't even be marketed. So um, I guess the, the scale of apples is a little, it's a little skewed by the fact that the, the market currently is for large apples. And then you look at the, the shape of your apples. So you can see conical has a smaller, um, the apples are upside down because when you're looking botanically at an apple, the stem was attached to the tree. And so that's the, the kind of the bottom, it's the, the, the starting point. But you can see conical has a smaller um, blossom end than stem end. Oblong is longer than it is wide. Flat is wider than it is tall. And, and round is pretty self-explanatory. And then you can mix all of those. So we were talking about how the bell flowers are long conical. Um, and you can have apples that are pretty round conical. I try and ask people to, to give it their best guess um, because when you start mixing those sizes, uh, those shapes, you really get into to more judgment. Whereas if you just have to pick one, is it the most conical, is it the most flat, is it the most round? Um, it makes it easier to share your observations. Then within that, there are some variations like wasted is where an apple comes in at the middle. Seamed is like with the winter banana where there are suture lines. Hammered, it, it looks like someone took a ball peen hammer to it or we're making hammered metal. And beaded or five crowned, that's looking at the blossom end uh, in the picture here. And you can see like in a, in a red delicious, there are little five little bumps on the bottom, that's five crowned. And beaded is when you've got little uh, kind of round portions down there. The reason it's five is that apples are in the rose family and the rose family does everything in multiples of five. Apple blossoms have five petals too. The background color um, in an apple is generally going to be green uh, or yellow, sometimes white 
And then you get a pattern over top of that. So um, as a one odd example, if you're looking at a, a red delicious and you look really close, generally that's actually a white apple that's covered entirely with red. So where if two apples, two red delicious each other when they were ripening, you'll get a little white spot um, where the color didn't develop. But so in terms of pattern, you can see a blush, you can see stripes, and those stripes can be, um, there can be stripes and speckles, and you can also have patches. And then there's dots on the surface of the apples as well. And sometimes those can be very useful in identifying, like on the um, Rhode Island greening, the dots against a green are an important part of understanding that that's what you're looking at. And then there's the russeting as well. So russeting looks like um, kind of like leather and is generally brown or green. And it's most common at the top or the bottom of the apple, but in some varieties like the Roxbury russet or the brown russet, it can cover the entire apple. So you're looking at the color in two ways. You look at it in the background, the pattern, and then sort of the details, the dots. Um, and sometimes those dots have have um, kind of halos around them as well. Um, bloom, as opposed to like a blush, is when you have almost a, a waxy covering that creates an additional color. So like in the blue paramain, there's a, a bloom that makes it look bluer over the red. So that's how you look at color in, a, in an apple. Here's botanically why uh, some of the structure looks the way it does. You can see how an, an apple fruit develops from the flower and also why botanists like to start at what seems to you to be the bottom of the apple because that's where the flower was. And you can see the remains of the sepals, which are the green part behind the flower. Apple fruit actually developed from um, what's called a hypanthium. It's the cup under the flower rather than just from the ovary inside of that. It's a, it's a kind of an interesting structure. And so the, the core is what would normally be the fruit in a lot of, of um, a lot of other plants. And then the fleshy part that we eat is actually the, the cup that had surrounded that in the flower. So probably more than you wanted to know about the anatomy of an apple. So when you're looking at that, you're looking at the basin and the calyx. So the, that's where the, the calyx is where the sepal, the green part behind the flower. And you can see in these that that can vary between being tightly closed or wide open. And those um, sepal points can be flattened or, or they can be upright. Um, and you can see also on some of these that they're, they're quite shallow or deeper, wide, narrow. Um, and sometimes they get something that's called scarf skin, which is where it's silvery with little hairs. Uh, all of these are useful in identifying a variety. And then if you're looking at what most people think of as the top of the apple and the botanists sort of think is the, the bottom of the apple, the stem end, you can see the cavity that the stem fits in. And it often also has russet around it. The stems can vary quite a bit. They can be fleshy, um, they can be long, they can be short, and how deeply they go in. Like on a lot of crab apples, they don't go in at all. They start just right on the top. And so all of this is useful in trying to identify what variety of apple you've got. Some of my favorite parts to look at is the, the central star on the inside, because this is so closely associated with the anatomy of the flower, it doesn't vary as much as features like color, which can be heavily influenced by the amount of sun that fruits get, or um, sometimes by, even by nutrients available to the plant. Whereas the central star is formed from, from that, the uh, ovaries in the, the flower. And so it's not got as much ways that it can be different uh, or that it can be influenced by the environment. And you can see these central stars can have very wide open tips. They can have rounded tips. They can have pointed tips proportionally to the size of the fruit. They can be very small or very large. They can be flocked like the large apple in the bottom there. And they can, some apples rarely have seeds, which is also a useful thing in identifying. They can be lopsided or like in the bellflower, they can be situated higher up in the apple um, or lower down. Or for example, in the Ben Davis, they can be very small compared to the, the scale of the whole apple. So again, 
useful in identifying. And I don't know if you can see the little dots around the, the central star. Those are the remains of where the, um, the anthers came through. So where the, the stamens were in the flower. So that's actually still, you're still seeing the remains of the flower in the fruit before you eat it. And then the core line, so this is around, this is if you cut it the other way, that core line can be wide or narrow, and then it joins the tube. The tube is where the, the calyx joins the core, and it can join it sort of at the top of that, in the middle of it, or the bottom. And this doesn't vary much between individual apples in the single variety. And so again, can be quite useful in identifying varieties. You can see also there's a lot of variation in color. Um, sometimes red-skinned apples, that red bleeds into the flesh, but in this case, it's also showing up in the core line. So once you have all that information about what your apple looks like, there are some good resources you can use to try and figure out what variety you've got. Um, my favorite reference is the Apples of New York, which is an ancient book um, from 1905 that describes all the apple varieties that were being grown in New York at the time with detailed descriptions. It's available online with some of the color prints that go with it, they're, they're watercolors. Um, the only trouble is that you, there's no key. So you can't say, I have a large green apple with no stripes what are my options? Whereas if you go to Apple name, you can select some features and it will narrow down uh, some of those varieties for you. So you might, you might sort of, through a series of different resources, be able to figure out at least some option as to what your Apple might be. Um, but there are some over, over 7,000 named variety of apples. Fortunately, not all of them were planted in the islands, but it can be really daunting sometimes if you have a complete mystery apple. So these are some resources. This is some of how you describe them, um, but don't get too discouraged if it takes a while to narrow it down. Uh, apples are amazingly diverse. What can you do with them? Do you, do you really need to know what variety you have in order to enjoy your apples? No, uh, or fruit at all. You, you might wanna know how to use it though, because all of this diversity means that some varieties are better suited for some uses than others. So it's often more important to know how to use something than to, to know what variety it specifically is. Now, knowing the variety can narrow down how to use it, but even without that information, you can figure out, you know, is this something I wanna eat fresh? Um, is it gonna make good cider? Does it keep well? How about sauce? How about apple butter? How about pie, jelly, dried? Uh, cider syrup is when you boil down sweet cider to, uh, um, to make almost a sweetener, hard cider, vinegar, spirits. Um, and I forgot to update this slide with some of the things that you can do with plums. So, you know, prunes, for example, um, lekvar, um, or some of the things that you can do with pears. Although I think pears overlap a lot with apples in terms of how we eat them. Uh, critical thing in pears is, is it ripe? Can I let it ripen somewhat on the tree, like the orcas pear? Or do I need to make sure I pick it when it's still nice and firm and how long will it take to ripen? Uh, pick your pears when the stems start to come off, even the tiniest bit, and then let them soften because if you leave them on the tree, for most varieties, um, they, will, they will just turn to mush, unfortunately. So how do you figure out how to use a fruit if you don't know what it is? Well, you can, the first thing is taste it. Um, you can identify a good fresh eating fruit because it will taste good. In terms of, of differentiating between something that's gonna make good pie or good sauce, um, you can bake it. And if it breaks down, it's probably better for sauce as long as it tastes good. And if it holds its shape, it might make good pie. When you're tasting it, some of the flavors that might not be good fresh can lend themselves beautifully to a product like hard cider or even sometimes to a jam or a jelly. So uh, does, you know, is it tannic? A lot of the pears can be really tannic when they're not fully ripe. And some of the varieties stay that way, but that can mellow in a peri, a, a fermented pear cider. Will it keep? You can take apples uh, or pears and wrap them and store them and see how their flavor develops over time. And then you can do something um, sort of more targeted by looking at the chemistry. So 
Um, the sweetness can be quantified as bricks, which is looking at the way in which the juice diffracts light. That's the little instrument there. You look through that and you see where the, the line stays. You can measure the acidity. So your tongue does a good job of saying, is this sour? But if you want to know more specifically, you can test the pH. Tannins can be titrated. Um, and pectins is a really fun measurement, actually. Uh, you, you don't want to eat it after you do this, but if you take juice from something you want to figure out how much pectin is in it, and you add um, rubbing alcohol to it, it'll coagulate the pectin. And then if you want to quantify that, you can actually dry it and weigh it. But you can, at that point, you can just see, is this rich in pectin or not, just by whether you get a weird looking um, mass in it when you add some rubbing alcohol. And then again, don't eat it once you've added, added the rubbing alcohol. It'll just give you a sense of whether that juice would make good jelly. Here's what some people are doing with our heritage fruit here in the islands. So the folks at Madrone Cellars and Cider are using heritage fruit in their hard ciders. And they're also doing something I find really exciting, which is that they're working with the old orchards. Um, one of the reasons I love it when people make value added products with heritage fruit is that it brings value to these old orchards and creates an incentive to look after them. And so as part of harvesting this, they're, they're helping maintain that orchard and they're interested in working on maintaining, I can't spell maintaining, my apologies, on maintaining some of the old orchards in exchange or, or helping maintain uh, old orchards in exchange for fruit. So um, I think there's a lot of opportunities for partnerships like that. So similar work being done uh, over on Orcus by Audra at Girl Meets Dirt. Uh, she's harvesting heritage variety, selling varietal preserves. And as part of that, establishing long-term stewardship relationships so that the fruit that she wants to harvest, those orchards can be looked after. And she's, she's using kings and orcas pears. Orcas pears aren't a heritage variety, but they're a very exciting local variety that's been around since the 70s. Italian prunes, gravensteins, and the crab apples. There's a, an underutilized fruit here. And she'll trade uh, store credit or product credit for fruit from small scale producers and also purchase fruit um, from local orchards. And again, building value for fruit and building this long, these long-term stewardship relationships. So we've got an example on San Juan of making hard ciders and working with the old orchards um, to make quality cider, an example on Orcus, making varietal preserves that feature individual heritage varieties. Boathouse Cider Works, which is also on Orcus, not as focused on individual varieties, but very focused on celebrating the local fruit, including wild fruit. So use, take, making use of old, um, those old heritage fruits, celebrating them for their abundance rather than necessarily for their individual character. And this year put out a special senior cider to support the Meals on Wheels program at Orcas Senior Center. Uh, Orcas Island Distillery is making spirits from the heritage apples and pears on Orcas and working, establishing some relationships, working directly with farmers to fully utilize fruit. So they're returning some of the pressed pomace as animal feed, working on reducing pest loads for producing high quality fruit. Um, these are the kind of partnerships that make it so that um, these, these old is that bring sort of the, the fruitful future uh, to these old orchards, that it's not just that people valued them in the past, but they have, they have immediate product value now uh, and ways of sharing uh, that harvest. <laughs> what can you do with old trees? So that's some of what you can do with old fruit, but so you have an old orchard. What do you do? How do you look after it? How do you make sure that the future continues to be fruitful. Um, you wanna be careful with old trees. They have survived for a very long time. They're very, very resilient, but you can't treat them like young trees. So take your time. Um, revitalizing an old orchard is gonna take at least three years. It's gonna take a lot more, but three years to even get to the point where you've got the tree in the shape that you want. If you go faster than that, you'll encourage too much growth um, and you'll be playing catch up from then on out. 
So you start with your dead damaged disease branches, crossing branches, rubbing branches. I highly encourage people to hire experts who are familiar with old trees. There are a lot of people who are really good at pruning. Uh, old trees are a special case and not all people who are good at shaping young trees are familiar with old trees, but there are definitely experts in the islands. So if, if it's not something you're ready to undertake yourself, and even if it is, I would encourage people to work with folks who are experienced. Consider the habitat value of your trees. You don't necessarily wanna take out all of the dead wood. Some of that dead wood is providing important habitat for native bees, um, which can be part of the pollination community in your orchard. And if you want to have some quicker results while you're working on revitalizing your old orchard, you can graft, that's the picture, the lower picture here, is grafting old orchard varieties onto younger trees. Now, this isn't a substitute to maintain those old trees. Those old trees are far more productive than these young trees will be for quite some time and probably than they ever will be. But it will allow you to back those trees up, make sure that if, if something terrible happens, you still got those varieties and also to get some quicker, exciting results where you, you've got young, trees producing right now while you work uh, on your, your older, older trees and work them carefully. So the picture there is actually my father who's uh, orchardist on Lopez. We did a workshop, um, I think it was just last in, in 2019, showing folks on Lopez some of the ways to approach uh, taking care of old trees out at the land banks preserve on Fisherman Bay Spit. And the way that my dad and his wife, Mary, who's Kevin Murphy and Mary Hayton, described their approach to old trees is a leave no trace that if you work a heritage tree carefully, you won't necessarily notice that it's been pruned initially. It'll still have the, the same kind of old shape and it's not going to maybe notice as much, but also respond very, very gently to it. Because if you stimulate too strong a response, you radically change the shape of that tree and it's gonna make it difficult to continue to, to shape it. Uh, it's gonna try and replace all the wood that came off. If you have old trees, you wanna be a good neighbor. Old trees are wonderful, but they also come with some challenges. So if you've got worms, which is mostly caterpillars, in your, your fruit trees, you don't wanna leave those on the ground. Most of those pests complete their life cycle in the soil under your tree. And if you leave all those fruit there, you're your orchard becomes a source of pests for all the surrounding orchards. And there's lots of things you can do with those. Um, wormy fruit can be used as animal feed. Um, can also, I mean, I was just making some apple butter where with the wormy fruit, I cut the bits out, but because it's cooked to death, it's, an, it's not a big, as big a deal. Um, be mindful of the habitat value of your trees though. So, when you're trying to address something like, like uh, caterpillars, you wanna consider your trees are habitat and that those caterpillars are food for an awful lot of, of native wildlife, uh, including bats and birds. And so you don't wanna contaminate that food source uh, with pesticides. There are lots of other ways of addressing um, pest issues. You can, you can clean up your fruit. You can remove some of the like tent caterpillars. You can remove the eggs in the spring. You can encourage more more wildlife to use your, your orchard. You can provide some water sources for bats, for example, and birds. Um, and you can, you can net fruit if it comes to that. So it's important to consider that, that old orchards can become a reservoir for some of the pests, as well as being an awesome source of fruit. Uh, consider sharing the varieties that you have. Um, it, it's no skin off your nose to share some cuttings from your trees when you prune them. Um, and consider sharing your harvest. I think most people with old trees, if they're not actually commercially producing, uh, have far more than is easy for them uh, to process and consume themselves. And the important thing here, and I'm gonna get a little bit more into this, is you can ask for help. You don't have to do this all yourself. People, people like working with old orchards. Um, you can also uh, contribute to what I'm doing by uh, letting us map or mapping your orchards so that we can put them into a map of the orchards in the islands and get a better sense of the, all the varieties here. This is, um, I'll put the website back up at the end 
in case you want to take a look at that. So sharing the harvest, being a good neighbor includes sharing the harvest. Um, and there are lots of ways to do that. So you can sell your fruit. This is definitely sharing. You could sell it to a value added producer. You could sell it, you could start making preserves and sell those. You could sell a you pick. Um, I was talking to someone about uh, heritage fruit in the islands recently, and they wanted to know where someone who doesn't live here could go pick. And I don't think we have many you pick opportunities. You could start a fruit CSA uh, to pay for your pruning. So people would invest in your orchard and then get fruit over the season. And one thing I think that we're sort of ripe for here is with all these long keeping varieties, somebody should start a business of storing apples and selling them when they're ripe in midwinter. You can give your fruit away. This absolutely encouraged. You can donate fruit to the food bank. This was mentioned at the beginning. Um, that's definitely a wonderful way of sharing your overabundance of fruit. You can invite your friends to pick. You could invite a value added producer to pick. You don't have to sell the fruit to the value added producer. You can give them to them as well. You could have a harvest party. Um, not right now, probably, although at least uh, being outdoors in orchard is, is a less risky activity. You can contribute to a community fundraiser like the senior cider that, that Libby at Boathouse Cider Works was making. Um, and you can invite a gleaning group to pick and distribute. I wanna talk a little bit about gleaning here um, and some of the ways that that's undertaken. So gleaning can be formal or informal. In fact, I would argue that it's important to maintain some of those informal gleaning opportunities I have friends on Lopez who routinely harvested some of the roadside trees and were really disappointed when there was a formal gleaning group that came and harvested them first. So particularly with fruit on public land, it can be important to recognize that there's probably already gleaning going on, that people are harvesting those fruit and that maybe they're not going to waste. Maybe they don't all need to be harvested and redistributed. So gleaning is pest control. This is one of the really premier ways of making sure that the fruit don't sit on the ground and become a reservoir of caterpillars and other pests. And you can glean apples and other fruit to feed to livestock if they're too bug infested. In terms of formalized gleaning, uh, there's a program at the Lopez Island Family Resource Center that started as a community initiative, um, folks noticing a need that they're are far more fruit produced than people were harvesting. So they organize volunteers through the resource center. Those volunteers annually harvest about 10,000 pounds of apples and, and pears. And these are all from private trees. So these are not fruit on public lands. And then they split it approximately three ways. Uh, the owners get a third, the volunteers can split a third, and the remaining third goes to community needs like the school, the food bank, seniors, um, and uh, I think during the pandemic, it also went to some of the, the, org the um, activities for students that some of the community organizations were putting on. So this is definitely a model that, that works really well for Lopez and could be replicated elsewhere. I know there'd been some talk about it on Orcas and um, I know that the Grange on San Juan has discussed um, gleaning opportunities as well. So that I, that I don't run over much over time here, <laughs> let me tell you about the fruitful future from why more than 100 years of apples and pears and plums spewing their seeds everywhere and growing is really exciting. So diversity in fruit, I mean, we've already talked about all these amazing varieties that grow here, but diversity, we have fruit for all climates, for all sorts of diverse tastes that can be prepared differently, they're resistant to different diseases and ripen over a long period of time. Um, that diversity, I mean, with apples, there's already many, many named varieties, but they're selected for different things. One of the things that's been happening in the islands since people started planting apples and pears and plums is that seedlings have been sprouting up and they've been under very heavy selective pressure by our environment to be resistant to disease, to be drought tolerant, to produce well uh, without any care, without any pruning or thinning. And those varieties are all over the islands and they're entirely unique. 
Um, some of them, when you taste them, you'll find don't suit you, but all of them present an opportunity to discover a new variety. So one of the stories that's important from the islands is the discovery of the orcas pear, which was a roadside variety that is now extensively grown. And presumably was a variety that had sprung up on the roadside on orcas and been selected for our climate and is also an incredibly delicious variety that ripens pretty well in the tree um, and that has beautiful smooth texture. And there are a lot more varieties to be discovered out there. So you can discover new varieties here in the islands. These are all um, apples, plums, and pears that I've encountered um, looking as seedlings around the islands. And you can also make new varieties. My friend Chinmayo planted an apple seed or probably many apple seeds. And one of those about eight years ago has produced this tree that now produces over 300 apples and she's planting more seeds. And you can see it's a beautiful, large apple and delicious. And this is a unique Chinmayo apple that no one else has ever created before and now that she can offer cuttings from. So the future is very fruitful here in the islands. There are ways that you can get involved in that fruitful future um, and help me out. You can let us map your trees. You can characterize the varieties you've got. You can share cuttings. We have annual sign wood exchanges. You can share fruit and contribute to the fruitful enjoyment in your own community. You can host heritage varieties. So this would be young trees. You can trial some of these locally adapted seedling varieties that no one else grows yet. You can plant those seeds and create new varieties. You can organize a gleaning project. And if you're a producer, you can start using local varieties in your products. Hey, thank you so much. It is a real treat to get invited to do a presentation like this. And my work has been supported by an awful lot of people and organizations. So I am immensely grateful to all of them and also to all the people who've let me stomp around the orchards, try and sometimes succeed in identifying the unique varieties they have and uh, taste and experience a whole lot of varieties. So thank you so much. I would love to take some questions. Let's see if I can stop sharing my screen. Uh, Madrona, thank you so much. This was that was quite wonderful, and I, I I'm kicking myself in that I didn't introduce you at the beginning. But this was an incredible introduction to both your uh, marvelous mind and knowledge of fruit trees, and also, quite frankly, your enthusiasm. I mean, that is just so sterling. And I thank you, Madrona. I really mm -hmm. appreciate it. Um, My pleasure. So I'm gonna. There uh, are. Let's see. I, I did want to mention that Jamie Hatch uh, wrote something in the chat box. She says that um, she, I assume she, uh, works for um, Girl Meets Dirt, and uh, she'd be happy to answer questions that way. And oh, good. Uh, so there's also um, somebody is saying, I'm interested in. Waldron Island apples. Some of the varieties that we've seen at the market from Waldron Island seem so unique. Do you have some of those varieties not found other places in the islands? So a lot of the varieties coming from Waldron are, there's a, the farm on Waldron at Sandy Point has more varieties of apples than probably anyone else in the islands, but it, they're not necessarily heritage varieties. So in the, the overview of varieties, I was mostly focusing on the varieties that have been planted here for 100 or more years. Um, a lot of those varieties are quite old, but, but relatively new to this area. So um, yes, a lot of those varieties are being grown on Waldron and nowhere else in the islands. Although I think almost all of them are grown somewhere else in the, in the country, probably in the state, but it is an amazing unique resource that we have a, a commercial farm that produces such a a diversity. But no, a lot of those are not the same as what you would find in an old orchard um, on Orcas or Locas or San Juan. Great. Um, and Hillary has a thumbs up. Thank you. <laughs> um, while I'm waiting for other 
uh, questions. I, I just want to make a comment, Madrona. I, um, one of the things you were commenting on was that um, was the idea of all these different varieties and, and whether they were ripened or not in their season and things like that. And I think we're both familiar with that list of recommended fruits for San Juan County in which they they had an E, an M, a L, and a W on the list. And that was for early, middle, late, or winter. And uh, definitely um, back when they had uh, not two varieties of apples, red delicious and rose delicious, they, I mean, uh, yellow delicious, they had 365 varieties and they were spread all over uh, without use of refrigeration or anything like that. So I, I think it's really that rich variety is really amazing that way, so. One other thing uh, that I think is often overlooked is if you read old apple descriptions, they tell you uh, the harvest time and then the season of that you actually consume them and they're often quite different. So our current assumption that you harvest an apple if, you're, if it's in your home orchard and eat it right away is relatively new. And that's also not how apples are necessarily commercially produced either. So I think it's a, a skill we need to relearn is when to harvest and when to eat. And anyone who grows pears knows this, but I, it's true of apples as well. Great. Okay, I have a question from John Latimer. Uh, where can you buy slash get young heritage apple trees to plant? Um, there are definitely nurseries that, that sell them. Um, the, in the islands, my recommendation is to buy rootstock and graft. Grafting is, is easy to do, really fun. Um, and that way you can get, you can be sure that you're getting the heritage varieties in the islands. Uh, rootstock is widely available. Um, Burnt Ridge sells very nice rootstock. I, I don't know if there's any local sellers. And then if you want a local producer of heritage fruit, um, uh, young seedlings, uh, the Bullocks also have some. Um, along with non sort of more more recent arrival varieties. But my personal recommendation is learn to graft. Um, you'll never want to stop and you'll end up with silly things like my trees that have 50 varieties on a single tree. Um, don't do that. <laughs> right. But yeah, I, I, I do an annual cyan wood exchange. Mostly it's been on Lopez, but I've been trying to make it virtual um, and I'm happy to graft trees for people as well. But if you're looking for a quick fix, probably the, the Bullocks would be the, the most local source that I know of. Um, there may be folks on San Juan as well. Thank you. Um, Nancy Shepler asks, what, what type of apples did 18th or 19th century American mariners take with them? Ooh, I don't know the answer to that. I can tell you what some of the longest keeping apples are. Um, like the, the Ben Davises are really good keepers and some of the, um, some of the russets, but to be honest, I, I don't know the answer to that. That's gonna take a, a different kind of historian. Well, and you also want to ask, uh, did Native Americans on the West Coast use the very early apple you mentioned? Sorry, can you repeat that one? I missed the end of it. Did Native Americans on the West Coast use the very early apple you mentioned. Oh, I think she may be so yeah. the native apples were definitely consumed here. And as far as we know, they were also uh, maintained. So one of the, the things I like to tell people is that apple cultivation in the islands goes back more than 200 years, probably goes back potentially thousands of years because people were harvesting and maintaining Malus fusca, the Pacific crab apple, um, as far as I'm aware, as long as, as there have been people in the islands, which is thousands of years. So yes, um, also some of the oldest orchards in the islands were planted by native homesteaders. So certainly the idea of growing and using apples was something Coast Salish quite, quite early on uh, started being a part of that industry as well. Thank you. Um, can I do a follow-up question with that? And so in using the crab apples, how, how did they use them? Um, 
I don't know as much about how people locally here. There's been better documentation further north. Um, crab apples consumed fresh, but they also creep quite well. And there's some good descriptions of people storing crab apples cold, um, including something I haven't quite figured out how to do, which is storing them underwater um, to, to have them ripen over a long period of time. Um, but definitely primarily eaten as a, a sort of a fresh fruit as opposed to as an ingredient necessarily in other dishes, as, as far as I'm aware. Um, and there's probably some good ethnographic uh, data on that, at least regionally, if not specific to the islands. Um, so there's a question asking you to repeat the place to buy heritage seedlings. Uh, the person didn't sure, quite hear so, what you were saying. So, so the heritage, the probably the place I know of in the islands that does sell grafted heritage trees is the Bullocks, um, the Bullocks Brothers over on uh, Orcas, the permaculture farm. But my recommendation, and they, they sell beautiful trees, but my recommendation, because it's really fun, really easy, and you'll get a wider diversity, is instead to buy rootstock, um, which is just the roots that you can graft onto, roots with a stem. Um, and there's many places that sell that. So I, I mentioned Burnt Ridge, but also uh, Rain Tree and One Green World all sell uh, rootstock that's well adapted to the islands. And then you can take cuttings in the winter, um, you know, any time after the leaves have dropped, store those cuttings and graft them on in the spring. So uh, typically around April and create a new tree. Um, and you don't have to graft just one variety on, although it's easier to keep track if you do. Um, and that I, I do a cyan wood exchange in the spring, which is to say that I collect cuttings from people and um, we'll, we'll give them or send them to people that they can graft onto their own trees. Uh, I'm not seeing any more. Let me ask one more question. <laughs> uh, and I think we've talked about this before, Madrona. Uh, in terms of rootstock, often you see on the older trees uh, an actual thorn it throwing off um, water shoots that are of a very thorny nature. Uh, and I had heard that it's possible that they used hawthorn as a rootstock. Um, could that possibly be also <laughs> the hawthorn? Yeah. So hawthorn works as a rootstock, a dwarfing rootstock for pears. And um, I think it's probably why hawthorn is so abundant uh, in the islands is because it was used as the primary dwarfing rootstock for pears at one point. Pears grafted onto hawthorn don't live as long as pears grafted onto other rootstock because hawthorn doesn't grow quite that large. Um, but on the other hand, if you have hawthorn, you can graft pears onto them. And one advantage of that, that um, the, I got a lot of my information on grafting from the bullocks. And one of the things they pointed out is that when you graft onto hawthorn, and if you graft kind of high, it actually will protect your graft from deer for a while. The only issue is eventually the hawthorn will get overgrown by the pear. And so it doesn't give you the kind of 100, 200, 400 year old trees um, mm. that you could get either a pear on its own root. I think pear on quince will live that long too. But yes, absolutely. Hawthorn works as a rootstock for, um, for pears. Wonderful. Um, I have another a request, but I'm going to go to another question first. Are hawthorn berries edible? Oh, yes. Yes, yes. Um, in fact, uh, we do an annual Eat the Invaders event on Lopez. This year, it didn't happen. We were trying to switch it to takeout, but didn't quite work. And last year, one of the dishes that I made, which a couple of the dishes I made for that were made with hawthorn berries. So you don't want to eat the seeds. Um, they're both very large, and they contain some of the precursors to cyanide. A lot of rose family fruit do. So this isn't, isn't super dangerous, but yeah, you don't want to consume the seeds, but the, the fruit themselves are edible, both raw um, and cooked. My favorite thing to do is make hawthorn ketchup, um, which is also known as hoss in sauce mm. and uh, is, is quite delightful fruity sauce. So I actually have a recipe for that on Quiat's website. And um, we also have native hawthorn, black hawthorn, that has multiple seeds. You still don't want to eat the seeds, but they're smaller and has kind of a custardy flavor. So 
Uh, yes, Hawthorne, are, uh, Hawthorne fruit are definitely edible, even the small ones here. Um, and there are some larger varieties that are cultivated uh, in Asia, for example. Um, and there's also a variety that's cultivated in Latin America that are large and used as a, a more common fruit than ours. Great. Um, so I'll, I'll, this is a great wrap up request. And uh, so it, it's, would you come to San Juan next fall to do a field workshop on IDing and grafting? And That's what I had totally hoped to do today was to do a, a workshop on ID as part of the lecture, um, but it's really hard to do remotely. So yes, absolutely. Um, but let's make that two workshops and do the grafting in the spring and the ID in the fall. So Great. yes, it would be my pleasure. Madrona, I wanted to thank you so much. This is just a wonderful program, and I, it was just a great, um, great finish to the Friends of the Library annual meeting, and, and your knowledge is just so wonderful. And I'm particularly pleased that we, we recorded this because this is going to be a treasured, uh, treasured video, I assure you. So thank you very much, Madrona. Really appreciate it. Thank you. And I'm, I'm indebted to Boyd for a lot of his research on the history of orchards. So I, I don't know if I got it in there enough, but it has been some really fun collaboration. And, and I appreciate this invitation and being able to share some of that too. Great. Thank you, Madrona. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for attending. So.